Welcome to Central 60 Second Commencement Program. We also want to welcome those who are watching online all over the world tonight and appreciate the opportunity to share this evening with you. At this time, we will be led in prayer by Corbin Phillips. Please remain standing for prayer. Mm, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you. There's a lot of things I could thank you for. But I'll pick two. I'll thank you for sending your son into the world to die for our sins so that we may be forgiven. 
and I thank you for all the hard work the graduates have put in and for uh, all the hard work that the staff and faculty have put in to our lives, Lord. I thank you for that. Please bless this ceremony. Help it to run, run smoothly. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for taking your time to be here tonight as we honor and recognize the 2019 graduating class. It will be a night filled with acknowledging God's blessings and work in their lives. And I know you're excited for that special time when your loved one crosses the stage and is recognized for the degree that has been worked for, prayed for, and paid for. However, we want to take a few moments to recognize some individuals who mean so much to Central. Central's board of directors is comprised of leaders from churches in the Midwest who commit themselves to the mission and success of this institution. They provide oversight and policy governance as stewards of the organization. And whether or not you've met them, you have all been blessed by their voluntary leadership, prayer, and sacrificial support of our ministry. They're pictured on our screen. One is here tonight uh, who played the organ for us, Mr. Ron Self, and we appreciate their leadership. They're listed in your program. And many of you uh, who are in attendance tonight have also attended here and been encouraged and strengthened and challenged by Central's outstanding faculty. They have prepared many years in higher education and in service to bring our students the biblical knowledge, ministry skills, and Christian worldview necessary to develop our students into servant leaders. And in addition, many of you have also been served by the hardworking staff that make our college function. Every employee, no matter their position or responsibility, is essential to Central's mission and vision being accomplished. So if you're a current staff or faculty member of Central, would you please stand so the graduating class can express their appreciation to you for your sacrificial ministry among us. Thank you. Now graduating class in this room are moms and dads, brothers and sisters, grandparents, aunts, uncles, spouse, friends, even children who have been there for you during your college education. They've given you money, supplies, and many other things. They've laughed with you, perhaps cried with you, have lifted you up in prayer before the Lord, and in many ways they have also been responsible for helping you reach this milestone in your life. And I know you're thankful for the support they've brought to you along the way. So if you in the audience are a family member of one of our graduates, would you please stand this evening? And while they're standing, graduates, would you turn and express your gratitude to all the family members that came tonight to be with us? It was really exciting for me to meet some of you this afternoon at our reception and many people here from various states around the country. Uh, we are honored to have you with us. Tonight we also have several in attendance who financially support the college, either individually or through their church and their donations make our tuition scholarship program possible. As recipients of this scholarship and the affordable education it has been able to provide, I know tonight's graduating class is thankful for their generosity in helping them earn their degrees. And I'd like all of us to take this opportunity to express appreciation to our donors for their support of this institution. <laughs> On the inside of the program at the back, you'll find special attention is given to the classes of 1959, 69, 79, 89, 99, and 2009. We will be recognizing uh, some of those graduates throughout the year here on campus. We like to do that. I think I counted 117 listed in those various years. Some of them are here tonight. Some are serving the Lord in various places around the world. Some of them have already received their eternal reward. And uh, as you walk the halls tonight, I hope you'll take a moment to look on the walls and see some of those graduates. Maybe there's a name you recognize there and you can go see a picture 
and say a prayer for them. But uh, right now, I'd like us to honor their contributions to the kingdom of God and the heritage of Central with just a moment of grateful silence. In just a few moments, our instructor of worship ministry, Brian Sevitz, will lead us in worship. He'll be joined by a worship team of some of our graduates. While they come to the stage, let me thank you again for helping us celebrate the accomplishment of our mission to develop servant leaders for the church. Each of tonight's graduates, we believe, embodies our vision of dedicated disciples who know God's word and serve his kingdom. They have been outstanding participants in our ministry community of servant leaders growing together in grace and truth. They have become recipients of an affordable opportunity to earn a college education focused on the authority of Christ and the Bible, and they tonight are becoming part of the heritage of Central Christian College of the Bible. All right, if you can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? All right, there we go. Would you stand? We're going to worship our God together this evening. This is an evening to honor our graduates, to celebrate them, but ultimately it's an evening of worship as we celebrate our Creator, everything He's done for us, and that's what we're going to do in these songs. Would you sing with us? Oh. 
Lord Jesus come even so come Lord Jesus come even so come Lord Jesus come even so
Amen. You can be seated. Appreciate the team for leading us in worship. Today. A big part of our campus experience includes worship services in chapel twice a week. And these students are among many who have spent lots of time preparing and leading us. And so tonight we wanted to make sure we had a chance for them to share their talents. I want to tell you a little bit about a special group of people that are mentioned in your program, and I think that it's in the middle, underneath the speaker's photo. The Honorary Delta Epsilon Chi is an honor society of the Association for Biblical Higher Education, our accrediting group. This year, the faculty selected three alumni from our anniversary classes for honorary membership. Selection is based upon having graduated at least 10 years ago, having demonstrated approved Christian character and displaying leadership ability in Christian work. And two of our recipients are not here tonight. They will be recognized at Heritage Day on August 30th, but I want to show you a picture of them and tell you their name. One is from the class of 1979, Joy Butler. Uh, and the second one is from the class of 1989, Steve Castaneda. But the one I want to tell you about tonight is also our speaker from the class of 1999, Matt Gilchrist. Matt Gilchrist decided to attend Central Christian College of the Bible in the summer of 1995, and it was late in the summer while he was attending National Youth Roundup Conference in Colorado. That decision changed his choices of college and the rest of his life decisions in many ways as well. He came from Portland, Oregon here in the fall of 1995 to become a student. While he was here, he was involved in basketball, in youth ministry. While attending, he became a youth minister at Madison Park Christian Church in Quincy, Illinois, where he served from 1997 to 2003. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Youth Ministry here from Central Christian College of the Bible in 1999. He later went to Colorado to be a youth minister at Rocky Mountain Christian Church, and in 2005 he came back to Missouri and began serving at Christ in Youth, where he led the service and missions departments. He also became a member of Central's board of directors where he served a three-year term. While at CIY, Matt encouraged many people to become active in missions and ministry even while they were still in high school. And he has helped the cause of Christian higher education through this recruiting effort and through his board membership. In 2015, Matt became the missional impact minister at Christ Church of Orinoco outside of Joplin, Missouri. And he wrote, I'm thankful for the investment that CCCB made in my life. He continued his education with Hope International University where he earned a master's degree in intercultural studies in 2010. So for faithful service to the kingdom of God, serving churches and organizations throughout the country, challenging young men and women to walk closer to God and service to the kingdom. Since graduating 20 years ago, the faculty recognizes Matt Gilchrist by granting him honorary membership into the Delta Epsilon Chi Society of ABHE. <laughs> Matt is also our speaker this evening and we're proud to have him back to address the campus community and the class of 2019. But before Matt comes to speak, would you stand with me for our scripture reading and prayer by two of our graduates, Christian Collins and Cassie Parks. Hello, everyone. Um, so our scripture reading tonight is from Exodus 4, uh, 1 through 4 and 18 through 20. It says, but Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff 
and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law. Please, his father-in-law, please let me return to my relatives in Egypt, Moses said. I don't even know if they're still alive. Go in peace, Jethro replied. Before Moses left Midian, the Lord said to him, return to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you have died. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and headed back to the land of Egypt. In his hand, he carried the staff of God. Gentlemen, will you remove your hats and avoid my, ignore my hair and pray with me? <laughs> Father God, I thank you so much for tonight. Um, I thank you for the, the dedication that the students here have put forth and just the, all the work that went into planning it. And uh, I thank you for the professors that have poured into us. And uh, I just pray for the speaker tonight that you would guide his words and let us all hear. In your name I pray. Amen. probably an unhealthy amount of jealousy I have that I don't have to make the same uh, request to please ignore my hair during this. <laughs> so you know, how badly I would love to be able to just ask that one more time. <laughs> it's good to be back at Central. Good evening. Welcome to graduation. I'm honored uh, to be back. It does not seem like 20 years ago uh, that I was sitting up here back when the graduating class could fit on stage. And so it's cool uh, to be back, to, to be a part of this community, as Dr. Fincher said. Uh, this is a special place, not a place I ever intended to arrive at, uh, but clearly a place that God had uh, for me. Graduates, I'm not going to bore you with uh, a lot of details about how different it was for me 20 years ago. Uh, I do want to point out one thing that it, I just have to say before I move on when I'm in this room. This was beautiful and fantastic. It just doesn't feel right for those of us that attended in the 20th century. This should be orange carpet, right? Yeah? There's no amens for that? We don't miss the orange carpet? I know that the, they say like that in heaven the streets will be paved with gold, but I'm holding out hope that somewhere in heaven there's a basketball court with orange carpet on it, and all of the central grads can get back together and just one more time test to see if our knees can stand running on carpet. Uh, it's good to be back though, but man, it's so different, so different this place than when I was here 20 years ago. See, when I started... Uh, the internet was just becoming a thing. I know that sounds really crazy. Nobody had cell phones in their pockets. We actually went to the library to study or to find these things called books. Uh, we had to carry them with us in a backpack. It was a totally, totally different world. And yet, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, some recent events have maybe reminded me that though some things have changed, other things haven't. You see, it was the spring of my senior year at Central uh, that a tragedy struck a high school in Colorado in Columbine, which really became for many of us kind of the iconic reference point when we hear about tragedies like that. And uh, my family was just sitting around the dining room table this week talking about another school shooting tragedy in Colorado. And so for all the things that have changed, there are some things that haven't changed. The fact that this is still a sad and broken world and the truth that you've been equipped with here at Central is still the very thing that this world needs. Uh, they don't need our creativity, they don't need our humor, they don't need our wit, they need the truth of who God is. And so I'm thankful uh, that within 10 seconds of walking into the Pioneer Room this evening and seeing uh, Mr. Reese, he saw my Bible in my hand and he said, ah, it's good, you have your sword with you. And I thought, that's perfect, isn't it? It's what we were taught, that this is the weapon with which we'll fight. Nothing else besides the truth. And so tonight, simply what I want to do is ask you, kind of equip you with three questions that I hope ultimately help this truth be true for you, that the extraordinary never becomes ordinary. My hope for you as you walk out of here is that the extraordinary never becomes ordinary. And I want to ask you just three simple questions that you can ask yourself for the rest of your life. And they're going to focus on three things that I think are really important uh, in kind of backwards order because I've got to do something a little bit weird. Uh, and so we're going to talk about ministry, we're going to talk about family, and then we're going to talk about God. First question I simply want to ask you is this, what's in your hand? We heard the, the text read, 
from Exodus chapter 4, and I'm thankful for this insight. It's not something I found. It's something I read in a book years and years ago. Uh, that interchange between Moses and God at the burning bush. There's so many different things. Uh, entire sermons and series could be preached just on the life of Moses, even just on the burning bush itself. But I just want to highlight and point out just one thing from Exodus chapter 4. And that is the only thing in this story that changes at any point. You see, at the beginning, Moses is beginning this fascinating dialogue with God, telling him how he's not qualified, how no one will believe him, how he's the wrong guy for the job, and all of those things. And God asks Moses a simple question, what's in your hand? And he says, it's a staff. And he tells him, throw it down, and he does. It turns into a snake. And unlike me, Moses actually stays there, right? If I see that, deal done. Forget burning bush, forget whatever else is going to happen, I'm out. But Moses stays, and then Moses does even more crazy things. God says, pick it up, and he says, I'll pick it up. Turns back into a staff. And you recognize that when God asked him the first time, what's in your hand, he simply answers, a staff. But then those verses at the end, 18 through 20, after Moses goes back to his father-in-law Jethro, Jethro and asks for permission to go back, he says, go back. And at the very end, it says this, so Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, started back to Egypt, and he took what with him? The staff of God in his hand. So what changed in that story? It wasn't Moses, and it definitely wasn't God. It was what he had in his hand. When it was just a stick in Moses' hand, it was pretty much worthless. But when God took his power upon it, it suddenly became the staff of God. Friends, here's my question or my encouragement for you of what's in your hand. You see, each of, us, you, each of you is gifted. My challenge is this, and I learned all of these lessons uh, the hard way, unfortunately. Don't rest on your talent. Work hard. You're not done because you've got a Bible college degree. Your life as a student never stops. You work hard, you study, you refuel yourself because sadly, the roadside is littered by men and women who just tried to rest on talent and get into ministry. It's just not the nature of how this is made to be because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about who God is and it's about his power. And so my encouragement for you is to continually ask yourself, what's in my hand? And hopefully it's not a gadget, hopefully it's not a trick, hopefully it's not a gimmick, but it's simply the truth. So my, my challenge for you is this, never quit asking the why question. We do it as kids, irritatingly so to our parents. Why, why, why? And then suddenly we get a Bible college degree and we don't feel like we have the right to ask why questions anymore, but you do. Your professor's relationship with you isn't over tonight. Maybe they'd like for that to be the case in some sense. I don't know. Nobody said anything to me. I just surmised. But regardless of that, keep asking the why question. One of my favorite old-time preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said this, If you can be great without prayer, your greatness will be your ruin. If God means to bless you greatly, he will make you pray greatly. And finally, this last quote from Darren Jackson, who says this, Where you place your hope is where you find your identity. If your hope is in you, in what you've got, in what you bring to the table, it's a dangerous place to place your identity. But if your hope is in our Heavenly Father, I can, trust you, I can promise you that your identity is in a good place. The second question I want to ask you is simply this, what do you have in your house? I'll be really honest, I don't have a lot of regrets in ministry. The only regrets that I have in ministry are the times that I robbed my family for the sake of the kingdom. And I refuse to believe that that has to be the case in order for ministry to be effective. Your family doesn't have to suffer. Your kids don't have to hate the church. Your wife doesn't have to be frustrated. Those things don't have to be true. But man, it's tough when the phone won't stop ringing. It was really nice when it was located on a wall and you could walk out of a room and you couldn't hear it. Now it's in your pocket. You don't have that luxury. Here's the thing. You know it already. People will never stop texting. There will never not be a message. The phone will never stop ringing. Your email will never stop dinging. You have to try and figure out how to turn it off, how to create healthy boundaries so that you can survive and you can thrive. And so my encouragement here is simply this, that you'd choose legacy over climbing ladders. You'll probably not have one ministry job your entire life, and that's okay. And I think dreams in ministry and dreams of what you want to accomplish, those things are good. God's ordained those things for us. But don't sacrifice legacy over climbing ladders at the expense of other people. 
So I'm preaching uh, from one of my two favorite Bibles that I have. The first Bible I didn't bring with me. It's not in great condition. It's my grandpa's Bible given to him by my grandma on Christmas Day of 1950. And as best as I can tell, it's the oldest piece of heritage going back in Christianity for my family. I don't come from a long line of Christians. I don't have dads and grandpa. Well, the dads would be a different story, I guess, altogether. I don't have a dad. I don't have grandpas. I don't have a lot of folks that have done ministry uh, and all of these different things. And so I cherish that Bible as one of the pieces that matters most. The other Bible is the one that I preach from tonight. This Bible has been with me since 2001. And what my 16-year-old son doesn't know is that when he turns 18, this is my gift for him. He knows he gets something. He doesn't know what it is. Spoiler alert, he thinks it's a car. Man. <laughs> <laughs> and man, is he going to be disappointed, right? It's like, you do remember I work in ministry, so we've got to scale these things back a bit. Every time that I've traveled, every time that I've preached somewhere, I've written that down and recorded that in this Bible. Not so that he can think his dad is great somewhere, but in some way, at least in my goofy brain, my hope is this, that it explains for him someday when he holds it where I was when I wasn't at home. So that he can step back and can hold this, and whether it sits on the office of a church he works at, or if he ends up getting his dream job at ESPN, or whatever it might be, that it can be something that is a legacy piece for him, like that Bible of my grandpa's is for me. And my encouragement for you guys is simply to choose to live a life of legacy. And I know that's such a typical old thing to say, and I sound like such a dad when I do it, and that's okay, because I am. I know right now you want to take the world by the tail and you want to do all of these things and don't ever lose your desires and your dreams, but just make sure that they're God-ordained things. Make sure that you work on that as a family. Make sure that you listen to your wife, to your husband, because they know you best and they love you more than anybody else ever will. Third question I have for you is this. What do you have in your heart? Because after what you have in your hand, and what you have in your house. My question is, what do you have in your heart? There's a statement that people have told me, and it's true. It's not what you know, but who you know that matters. And the reality is that's pretty true. Most of the relationships I have, even the ministries that I've been a part of, has been more to do with who knows me and is crazy enough to hire me than it is to do with anything bouncing around in between my ears, right? But take it out of the, the professional sense and let's just keep it in the spiritual. Who you know is more important than what you know. Do you know Jesus? Like, I know you're supposed to because you're about to get a Bible college degree. You're going to get a job in a church. But never forget that. That the number one thing for you is not, again, who you are, but who he is. There's this uh, gentleman that spoke profound things into me during my college experience. At that point, I just referred to him as Mr. Curtis, and I remember writing this down, and it's been in my journal for all these years. It says, if we train up our young people to listen to and obey Christ, he will direct their paths. I'm more and more convinced that it's not the church, the organizations, the colleges, but Christ who calls his own through the maze that we place before them. And I believe that. No disrespect to those other organizations, but we point folks first and foremost to who Jesus Christ is. If we do that, God does the rest of the work. I'm sure we've all heard numerous times the famous quote from Hudson Taylor, God's work done God's way will never lack God's resources. But it's true. Do things his way. Another one of my favorite old-time preachers, A.W. Tozer, simply said it this way, God wants worshipers over workers. So never stop being a worshiper. And can I tell you, from ministry perspective, that gets increasingly hard because you get busy and you're the one giving and you're the one providing and you're the one meeting and giving and going and all of those things. Never stop being a worshiper. Never stop filling your tank. Never buy the lie that you've learned enough, that your talent is strong enough, that you can just pull this one off. And when you do that, first of all, thank God for saving your bacon. And second of all, decide never to do that again. I think if I was going to give you a piece of advice about your heart, it is simply this, that God's work in us 
is more important than his work through us. What he does in you is the most important thing because that spills back to everything else. If he's done his work in you, that'll impact your family. And consequently, that will impact the ministry that you're a part of. But it all starts with your heart and with what God's going to do for you. When I first moved back to Missouri, I didn't grow up around a lot of snow in Oregon because God loves us and kept it away. And so didn't deal with it. But I remember learning this piece of advice about driving in the snow. Uh, and I'm halfway decent at driving in snow now. And it was simply this, that the hands and the feet follow the eyes. That you look where you want to go and intuitively the rest of your body seems to make that happen. I think that's good advice for driving in snow. I think it's a better advice for leading in Christian ministry. That your hands and your feet will follow your eyes. So what do you look at? What do you fill your heart with? What are the things that you focus on? Because those things that you fixate on are the things your hands and your feet will naturally gravitate to. And that will determine the type of ministry and life that you have. And lest I can sound critical of the word worker because it's a very biblical word, I do land very heavily on the fact that God wants worshipers over workers because worship has a different act to it than work does. And I can get confused when I'm a worker for God, but I can be extremely clear when I know that I'm simply a worshiper for God. And so I want to just leave you with this encouragement. I started with it this evening that I don't want the extraordinary to ever become ordinary. Here's what I mean. Uh, Dr. Fincher said I grew up in Portland, and so I remember as a young kid going up to the top of the mountain that my family lived on in Mount Tabor and watching across the Columbia River as Mount St. Helens erupted. Not a fantastic thing for a five-year-old to try and process. Uh, hey, cool, the Earth's exploding. It's close by. This seems good. I remember riding my uh, chips tricycle around with a, like a dust mask on for a while to keep the ash out of my lungs, that kind of a thing. Pretty fascinating event that not lots of people got to see. But then I got to school age and we took a field trip and it was cool because you can go and you can crawl through the lava tubes and they would show you videos of the mountain exploding and they would tell you all these different facts and it was cool. And then the next year we went on the same field trip and it was pretty cool. And then the next year we went on the same field trip and it was all right. And then the next year we went on the same field trip and I didn't fit in the lava tubes as well and the videos were getting older and the information was the same. And the next year and the next year, year after year, we went back to the same place. And every year it got more and more boring and I dreaded it more and more. Now my guess is for those of you that have never seen it, never been there, you're like, that sounds dumb. I would love to go see that. But for me, something extraordinary had simply become ordinary. Ministry, following Jesus, caring for your family, it can never become ordinary. And I don't say that from a person who's done that perfectly. I say that as much a word of caution as I do just as a plea for you as graduates. That what you get to do to serve the kingdom, to serve in a church, in a nonprofit, to do whatever it is that you might do is an absolutely extraordinary thing that the creator of the universe didn't just love you enough to send his son so that you could spend eternity with him, but he actually asked you to act as his ambassador, as his hands and feet, to be his mouthpiece to a world that is sitting around waiting and watching and looking for truth. Never, please, never let that become something ordinary. Ministry should never be a J-O-B. It should never just be office time. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's a gift. And it's a responsibility. So my prayer for you is 20 years from now, maybe one of you gets the opportunity to stand up here and talk. And I hope I'm back in the back somewhere. I'd preferably like to be in a chair because I'm sure I'll, my back will hurt to simply cheer you on. But if I'm not, just know this, that God loves you, that he's brought you to this point that whether your future seems extremely clear or extremely cloudy, the truth is this, the God that brought you to this point has a plan for the rest as well. Simply lean into that. And if you ask yourself those questions, what's in your hand, what's in your house, what's in your heart, my prayer is that the gift that is life with Christ is always, always extraordinary. May God bless you guys.
Thank you, Matt. Memories of those years that students like Matt were here and they were playing basketball on orange carpet and thinking about their futures uh, are really amazing to reflect back on and see what they have been able to do, what they've been able to learn, and now tonight what they've been able to share with us. So I appreciate you coming up and uh, for sharing with the class. And I hope we'll all be able to remember those three questions of looking at what's in our hand, what's in our house, and what's in our heart. Well, we're getting close to the time that the students will get their degree. I want to highlight just a couple of things first. If you open the program to the uh, inside front cover, you'll find listed uh, not only the members of the class of 2019 in the middle, but also some special award recipients. And I'd like to take a few moments to call your attention to the senior awards section of your program. Yesterday, these individuals were recognized in our annual honors chapel, and uh, I think it's probably recorded online if you'd like to watch it. But uh, I'd like to just highlight some of these awards. Please hold your applause to all of these that have been mentioned, and then we'll recognize them all together. Starting at the bottom of the page, we have the cum laude honorees recognized for maintaining, maintaining a cumulative GPA of 3.50 or above. Five students are listed there. The magna cum laude honorees earned a cumulative GPA of 3.75 or above, and six received that honor. And the summa cum laude honorees generated a cumulative GPA of 3.9 or greater. And when our graduates walk across the stage tonight, you'll notice that some are wearing yellow cords, and those highlight their accomplishment of those honors. Again this year, the students of Central recommended and selected a female and male graduate who best embody servant leadership to the rest of the campus. Those two recipients of the Servant Leader Award were given an embroidered towel to symbolize the act of washing the feet of others and recognize the servant's heart that they showed our campus. The faculty elected three graduates this year to the Delta Epsilon Chi Honor Society of the Association for Biblical Higher Education. The qualifications for scholastic membership are at least a 3.3 cumulative GPA, the demonstration of Christian character and leadership ability. And they will also be wearing cords as they walk across the stage. Each year, the faculty selects several seniors to speak during a spring chapel series. And under the leadership of our preaching professor, they developed a series of sermons on the I am statements in the Gospel of John. At the end of the semester, the faculty selected the top orator from among those who spoke. This year's class orator, Jason Merriman, spoke at the end of yesterday's honors chapel. He also played the guitar a little earlier tonight, which means he breaks the stereotype that musicians can't also be preachers. You can be both. Jason will be wearing a medal for that as he crosses the stage. The salutatorian honor is given to the graduating senior who completed at least 90 hours of credit at Central and has the second highest cumulative GPA. This year's salutatorian gave our invocation, Corbin Phillips. And the valedictorian honor is awarded to the graduating senior who completed at least 90 hours of credit at Central with the highest cumulative GPA, and uh, that is Nathaniel Littler, and he'll give our benediction at the end of the service tonight. And those three honorees will all be wearing medals as well. If you were on that page, would you please stand and we will recognize you for receiving one of these awards. Congratulations on your hard work. And now our academic dean, Dr. Eric Stevens, will come and introduce the graduates. Good evening, family, friends, classmates. We now come to the moment for which you've been patiently waiting. Only took us about an hour to get here, but we're here. After each graduate is named, you are welcome to applaud and cheer your graduate. Please refrain from using noisemakers. Look what I'm wearing, I have to say something like that. <laughs> when you have finished applauding, then I will share the future plans of that graduates. Graduates, shall we begin? All right. 
Will the candidates for the associate degrees please come forward? These students have completed a minimum of 60 hours of study composed of biblical studies, professional studies, and general studies. From Morrowville, Kansas, Sydney W. Applegarth. Sydney has earned the Associate of Biblical Studies and he plans to do ministry in Denver over the summer. He's seeking God's leading and eventually plans to do overseas ministry work with his wife. Yeah. <laughs> From Primgar, Iowa, Aaron M. Cooper. Aaron has earned the Associate of Biblical Studies degree and she plans on going to Namibia for three to six months in August. And after that, she intends to serve the Lord overseas. From Quincy, Illinois, Carla J. Green. <laughs> Carla has earned the Associate of Biblical Studies degree. She plans to take a break from school and focus on family, work, and ministry. From Milton, Delaware, Aileen E. Pruitt. <laughs> Aileen has earned the Associate of Biblical Studies degree, and her future plans are to continue to serve with her husband by being a people helper. From Dallas, Texas, Elias E. Sorto. Elias has earned the Associate of Worship Arts degree, and he desires to do whatever God wants him to do. But in the meantime, he will continue ministry back at his home church, Lily of the Valley, in Dallas, Texas. From Huntingburg, Indiana, Hannah J. Taylor. <laughs> Hannah has earned the Associate of Biblical Studies degree, after graduation, she'll be getting married, moving to Phoenix with her soon-to-be husband in July. There she hopes to serve at a church and see where God takes them after that. We have several students who have earned the associate degree in absentia. And they are Jason H. Frederick, Levi G. Hummel, R. Ekaterina Hummel, Caleb McCain, Michael Neal, and Joel Watts. We also have three students um, who have earned the associate degree, but are also receiving a bachelor's degree tonight. Those are Christian Collins, Amy Ecker, and Preston Kulesha. Yeah. Will the candidates for the Bachelor of Religious Studies degree please come forward to receive your degrees? These students have earned a minimum of 60 hours at Central composed of biblical studies, professional studies, and general studies, and an additional 60 to 70 hours elsewhere. They earned those extra hours either before they came to Central, while they were here through a partnership, or after they finished their requirements with us. From Litchfield, Illinois, Valerie J. Fincher. Valerie has received the Bachelor of Religious Studies and Missional Occupations degree. She also earned an associate degree in nursing from our educational partner, Moberly Area Community College, as part of the requirements for the BRS degree. Val plans to spread the love of Jesus at a, as a pediatric ER nurse starting in June. From Jefferson City, Missouri, Jessica K. M. Hardwick. Jessica has earned the Bachelor of Religious Studies and Missional Occupations degree. She earned teacher certification from our educational partner, the American Board for Certification of Teacher Education. That was included as part of her requirement for the BRS degree. Jessica plans to get a teaching job at an elementary school in Jefferson City, Missouri. From Macon, Missouri, Stacy L. Vogan. Stacy has received the Bachelor of Religious Studies degree in Missional Occupations with a minor in Christian Counseling. 
Stacy plans to work in Christian counseling and eventually pursue a master's degree in counseling. From Altamont, Illinois, Jason S. Williams. Jason, will continue, Jason has earned the Bachelor of Religious Studies in Christian Leadership, and he will continue to look for opportunities in the local church by leading, preaching, and teaching. When he finishes his current career, he desires to attain a full-time ministry position. He thanks Central for being a big part of his journey. Bachelor of Religious Studies graduates in absentia are Michaela S. Henniger and Matthew D. Tyler. Will the candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree please come forward to receive your degree? These students have earned a minimum of 132 hours composed of biblical studies, professional studies, and general studies. They've studied within a particular emphasis including Christian counseling, Christian education, Christian ministries, cross-cultural ministry, preaching ministry, and youth and family ministry. From Nicholasville, Kentucky, Cameron L. Brooks. Cam has received the Bachelor of Science in Christian Counseling degree, and he plans to continue his education eventually until then, he will follow God's calling. From Moberly, Missouri, Rachel D. Busson. <laughs> Rachel has earned the Bachelor of Science in Youth and Family Ministry, and she plans on learning how to be a parent along with her loving hun husband, Alec. They are looking into where God might be leading them and look forward to living lives of obedience to the Lord. From Shellsburg, Pennsylvania, Christian A. Collins. <laughs> Christian has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Counseling degree along with the Associate of Worship Arts. Christian has been accepted into the Ministry Residency Program at Cornerstone Christian Church in Belleville, Illinois. From Janesville, Wisconsin, Amy J. Ecker. Amy has received the Bachelor of Science in Christian Ministries degree. She hopes to attend school in Virginia to learn American Sign Language. She's not quite sure what God has planned for her after that, but she hopes someday to interpret in a medical setting. From Green City, Missouri, Keegan S. Franey. Keegan has earned the Bachelor of Science degree in Youth and Family Ministry, and he will be marrying his beautiful fiance and moving to Phoenix, Arizona. While there, I've heard this story before tonight. While there, he'll be gaining pastoral experience while earning a master's degree in strategic ministry. Keegan hopes to listen to God's guidance in his life and see where God pushes his heart to go. From Joliet, Illinois, Miranda J.L. Harvey. Miranda has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Education degree. She's been accepted into the residency program next year in children's ministry at Cornerstone Christian Church in Shiloh, Illinois. From Litchfield, Illinois, Hannah D. Hopkins. <laughs> Hannah has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Counseling degree. Hannah's getting married June 22nd, 2019 to the amazing Aaron, and in the spring of 2020, we'll start a master's program. From Peoria, Arizona, Preston T. Kulesha. <laughs> Preston has earned the Bachelor of Science degree in preaching ministry and the Associate of Biblical Studies. Preston will participate in the residency program at Christ Church of the Valley in Phoenix, Arizona. After that, his plan is to follow God's call to vocational ministry 
wherever that may take him and Cass. From O'Fallon, Illinois, Amber in Lauderdale. Amber has earned the Bachelor of Science in Youth and Family Ministry degree. Amber plans to have as much fun as possible now that she won't ever have to do homework again. <laughs> From Quincy, Illinois, Janika D. Leyendeckers. Janika has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Ministry degree, and she will move back home to Quincy and begin work at Blessing Loretta M. Eno Early Learning Center. From Chillicothe, Ohio, Nathaniel L. Littler. Nathaniel's going to take some time off this summer to reassess and figure out what God wants him to do to further his kingdom. The past two years have been very eventful and life-changing, and so he's going to rely on the Lord to open a new path for his future plans. Nathaniel's trusting God's plans and knows that God will lead him wherever he needs to be. From Columbia, Missouri, Billy J. McKinley. <laughs> Billy has earned the Bachelor of Science in Preaching Ministry degree. He plans to go where God leads him, whether it be more education or working in churches, he plans to spend time with his family, travel with his wife, and work in his garden and do some home improvements. From Trenton, Missouri, Ronald G. McPherson. Ron has earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Bible. He will continue the Lord's work serving his congregation in Trenton as a full-time pastor. From Bell, Missouri, Cassandra P. Parks. <laughs> Cassie has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Ministries degree. After graduation, she'll begin a year-long residency at the Blue Springs Christian Church in student ministry. Cassie plans to marry her best friend and fiance, Aaron Gwynn. Most of all, she strives to listen to God's call for her life and do ministry in whatever capacity he sees fit, whether it be in the United States or overseas. From Elizabeth City, North Carolina, Haley R. Pelton. <laughs> Haley has earned the Bachelor of Science degree in Christian Counseling. She plans to get married to Spencer, move to Arizona, and support him in his master's degree before pursuing her own graduate studies. From Centralia, Missouri, Matthew R. Perry. <laughs> Matt has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Counseling degree. He plans on working for two years to pay off his debt and then get his master's in counseling at an APA approved university or college. He also hopes to enjoy time with his church back home, loving his family. As for where God will take him eventually, he doesn't know, but he's willing and ready to go wherever God takes him. From Bevere, Missouri, Aaron B. Peter. Yeah. Aaron has earned the Bachelor of Science degree in Bible. Also at the same time, he has earned the Bachelor of Arts degree in Business Administration from our educational partner, Lincoln Christian University. After graduation, Aaron will work at Camp Sunshine in Maryland. From Lee Summit, Missouri, Corbin M. Phillips. Corbin has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Counseling. After graduation, Corbin is going to get a job in the Kansas City area, marry his beautiful fiance, Kat, and continue his education in the field of counseling in that order. From Quincy, Illinois, Spencer J. Roberts.
Spencer has earned the Bachelor of Science in Youth and Family Ministry. Spencer has been accepted into the residency and master's program at Christ Church of the Valley in Phoenix, Arizona. From Richland, Missouri, Jamie L. Sassine. <laughs> Jamie has earned the Bachelor of Science in Cross-Cultural Ministry. Jamie plans to begin training and preparation for long-term ministry in Japan. From Simi Valley, California, John M. Teal. John has earned the Bachelor of Science degree in Bible. He intends to continue serving his local congregation and focus on building Common Grounds, a unity effort for the restoration movement. The mission of Common Grounds is to inspire and pray for greater unity within the restoration movement. They encourage the development of local groups and relationships that bridge our party lines, and they believe the true restoration comes by the unity of the Spirit. They do so because Jesus prayed for that. From Stroh, Indiana, Tressa J. Terry. <laughs> Tressa plans to marry her amazing fiance, Elijah Jeffrey. I think that's tomorrow, you all are invited. <laughs> and pursue a career that involves working with youth. From Bell, Missouri, Abby L. Tibbetts. <laughs> Abby has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Counseling. After graduation, the plan is to take a nap without the guilt of homework hanging over her head. <laughs> Sometime after that, she'll be getting married, moving to Russell, Kentucky, where she'll be helping her husband-to-be in his ministry. In the spring of 2020, after plenty of guiltless naps, should go back to school to begin a master's degree for addictions counseling at Indiana Wesleyan University. From Bramer, Missouri, Alexander J. Walters. <laughs> Alex has earned the Bachelor of Science degree in preaching ministry. He'll continue to work at Chick-fil-A Stadium Boulevard and do part-time preaching until the opportunity arrives to work full-time at a church. He'll continue doing this until he completes raising funds to return to Japan for mission work. From Marion, Iowa, Tyler R. Wright. <laughs> Tyler has earned the Bachelor of Science in Youth and Family Ministry, and he'll be starting a residency with Cornerstone Christian Church to develop skills and experience in order to move into full-time youth ministry wherever God leads him. From Farmington, Missouri, Mallory K. Zarcone. <laughs> Mallory has earned the Bachelor of Science in Christian Counseling. She plans to take a break, get her life together, and then move on to grad school at Johnson University. Bachelor of Science graduates in absentia, Justin W. Bowles and Serata C. Say. <laughs> Will the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degree please come forward to receive your degrees? These students have earned a minimum of 132 hours composed of biblical studies, professional studies, and general studies. They've studied within a particular emphasis, including biblical research, Christian counseling, Christian education, Christian ministries, cross-cultural ministry, preaching ministry, and youth and family ministry. This includes having earned a minimum of 15 hours of language studies in biblical Greek and Hebrew. From Franklin, Indiana, Hunter J. Chadwell. Huh? What did I say? <laughs> the heart wants what the heart wants, I guess. <laughs> Hunter has earned the Bachelor of Arts degree in preaching ministry. He's pursuing a master's degree at Johnson University in their strategic ministries field. 
He'll attend the Indiana Indianapolis location and intends to complete the program in one year. From Indianola, Iowa, Stephen E. Grant. <laughs> Stephen has earned the Bachelor of Arts in Preaching Ministry. He plans on pursuing graduate studies or an associate pastorate or senior pastorate position in the Midwestern United States. From Columbus, Nebraska, Benjamin A. Jones. <laughs> ben has earned the Bachelor of Arts in Preaching Ministry. He plans to pursue a Master of Divinity at Midwest Theological Seminary. From Waterloo, Iowa, Jason S. Merriman. From Waterloo, Illinois, Jason S. Merriman. Jason has earned the Bachelor of Arts in Christian Ministries. He says he's going to spend time back home, be best man at a wedding, then go to, to Namibia, Africa for a three-month internship with David and Sandy Eccles. Bachelor of Arts graduates in absentia, Matthew T. Renault. Will the class of 29 please stand? 2019, please stand. <laughs> Skipped a number in there. Before I confer your degree tonight, I would like to charge you with these words, paraphrased and adapted, from Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 4, chapter 2 and chapter 4. You have become our spiritual children, and we urge you to be strong in the grace of Christ Jesus. You have heard us teach many truths, confirmed by the witness of God's word and his people, so we urge you to teach faithful people those truths so they can train others. During your time here, we have given you much to learn. In time, the Lord will help you understand it even better than you do today. But one thing you must always understand is the importance of Christ's resurrection. His life's work is the good news you accept for your life and share with others. It is worth enduring anything and everything in order to bring salvation to the people of God and glory to Christ Jesus. Many who faithfully serve Christ have suffered. Even if you must join them, please be faithful. If you find yourself suffering for Christ, never forget these truths. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure with him, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we or anyone else becomes faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Your work should not be arguing over the useless words of controversial questions and foolish speculations. Instead, present yourself approved to God as a diligent worker. You will never be ashamed if you accurately handle and correctly explain the word of truth. You may hear that some have gone astray from the truth, but God's firm foundation still stands. So run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts, and run toward things that build righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace. Desire the companionship of those who follow the Lord with a pure heart. You will never accomplish purity by quarreling with difficult people, but by responding to them with kindness, patience, and gentleness. As you prepare for the day your service comes to an end, and your departure into the next life is imminent, be sure you can say, these things. Like a soldier, I have fought the good fight. Like an athlete, I've finished the race. Like a farmer, I've been faithful to complete the harvest. And then the crown of righteousness will be presented to you and everyone else who looked forward to his appearing. 
upon the recommendation of the faculty, the approval of your curriculum completed by the Board of Directors, and by the authority given to me by the Board of Directors, it now gives me great pleasure as President of Central Christian College of the Bible to confer upon you your associate or bachelor's degree with all the rights, privileges, responsibilities, and obligations attached thereto. May God bless you and use you for his glory until we meet again in eternity. You may now move your tassels. You may be seated. In the years to come, I hope you see the value of the time you've spent becoming a dedicated disciple who knows God's word and serves his kingdom. Your education, as I mentioned earlier tonight, was only possible because of the generosity of people and churches who have given sacrificially to Central Christian College of the Bible so you could earn a degree at an affordable price. And once you settle into the next phase of your life, I hope you'll consider making a gift at least once a year to bless future students as you've been blessed. I started supporting Central during my freshman year of college, and I've continued to do so for almost 30 years. I still remember listening to Mr. Pelfrey talk about this, and I listened, and I started, and I've never stopped. It's an important part of my stewardship and one of the clearest indicators of the value I place on this institution. One of my personal goals as president is to encourage our graduates to return the blessing of their education by making their own financial contribution to their alma mater. And it would thrill me if every graduate of Central made a donation each year to celebrate the anniversary of their graduation. A gift of just $10 a year since graduate, for every year since graduation would be affordable for most of our graduates, even the ones in ministry. And more than the money, it would send the message that Central's education is something you still value and that you want to support for the next generation of students. I hope you'll consider making that kind of stewardship commitment, and that's why I'm uh, providing in your diploma cover tonight an envelope just for you. Now, we have Heritage Day on Friday, August 30th, a little more than three months from now, and when you take that envelope home with you, I hope you'll put a dollar here, a dollar there, a dollar this day, a dollar that day, and bring it back to Heritage Day, August 30th. We'll have lots of events to enjoy. You'll get to visit with people you haven't seen for a while. We will love to hear what you've been doing since graduation. You can see all the upgrades we're doing this summer, see the people you graduated with and enjoy the day. And you can just drop that envelope in the giving box out in the hallway and then pick up another envelope to start for the next year. Now, if you can't come, don't worry about it. The address is on the front, it mails. The website's on the back, and you can even call, so there's several ways to do it. But we do hope you will come to Heritage Day, even if you can't give. And with, within tonight's program, there's an opportunity to describe for each of you here to make a special gift to our full tuition scholarship program. Your honorary gift can recognize a current graduate, a past graduate, or a graduating class. These gifts will provide funds for the generous tuition scholarships we've awarded our students since 2001. Out in the hallway, there's a donation station with Envelopes, feel free to take one with you. You can mail it back later or just slip it in that box tonight. Your gift to Central will help us continue to prepare students like these that we have prepared and sent out tonight for great service in the future. Now, there's one more special presentation we need to make tonight, but it won't take long. This commencement marks the sixth and final one under the direction of Dr. Eric Stevens, our academic dean and your diplomas will be signed by him, and that will be the last class to have their diplomas signed by him. He took over the position in late 2013 and has served for almost six full school years. In fact, this is one of only three classes that would have been privileged to have him for academic dean their entire career. Now, he isn't leaving us, but will remain on the faculty and shift his responsibilities to be the dean of student success so he can help even more students like you to succeed here and complete their course of study. He's looking forward to those opportunities to focus his attention on teaching and his dedicated leadership of our faculty and staff has been notable over the last six years. I'm personally thankful he's been part of our leadership team. I'd like to ask the class of 2019 to lead out in showing appreciation to Dr. Stevens for his service in this vital <laughs> Thank you. 
And now I want to introduce you to our new Vice President of Academics, Dr. Jim Estep. Jim, if you'll come on over. Dr. Estep is a native of Lexington, Kentucky, a graduate of Cincinnati Christian University, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts, a Master of Divinity, and two Master of Arts degrees. He later earned a Doctor of Ministry in Christian Education from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and a PhD in Educational Studies from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's an author, having edited, written, or contributed to at least 16 different books, has served in ministries for over 25 years while also being an academic administrator at schools like Great Lakes Christian College, Kentucky Christian University, and Lincoln Christian University. Most recently, Jim has served as equipping pastor at a church in Georgia while helping develop a ministry known as Effective Elders, which we've used on our campus for churches as our, in our area as well. Dr. Estep brings a wealth of experience teaching, administering, writing about, and evaluating institutions of Christian higher education in North America. There's a lot more I could tell you about him, but I'm looking forward to letting our faculty and students get to know him through his work here, which started May 1st. To symbolize the transfer of the position from Dr. Stevens to Dr. Estep, I have two items to pass along. The first is a large print edition of the college catalog. <laughs> Perfect for proofreading, making changes, highlighting key policies, adding notes, and omissions. It, it contains a listing of the faculty, the courses, the degrees, the college's theological affirmations. And all of those things symbolize the sacred trust that Dr. Estep is accepting and the role he will play in shaping the training of our students through those vital elements. And the second is a bottle of acetaminophen. <laughs> now there's only 40 tablets in there, but more is available at the college bookstore when you need it. It may come in handy when there are things like student appeals, faculty meetings, cabinet conversations, and all the other discomforts that come with the office of a vice president. But I hope this bottle of pain reliever reminds you that God gives grace to the humble and promises that we can cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. Let's join in warmly welcoming Dr. Estep to this position. Thank you, guys. And I want to thank you all for coming tonight to our great celebration of the accomplishments of this class. Our benediction will be worded by our valedictorian, Nathaniel Littler. Following the benediction, I hope you'll remain standing for the recessional. As the music plays, the graduates will be spreading around the auditorium, and that will symbolize how we are sending them around the world. You're then welcome to congratulate them right here in this room. Would you please stand for prayer? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for guiding us and equipping us with the tools that we need to further your kingdom here on earth. We are so thankful that you are a loving and graceful God, that you gave us your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us when we honestly did not deserve it as the worst sinners in the world. I just pray that you will use these gifts and these tools that we have gained, that you will help us, guide us, strengthen us, and put us in the places you want us to be, Lord. I pray that you will continue to help us make a difference here in the world, to let them know that there is hope, that even in the darkest of times, even in the darkest of places, that you can be present, Lord, and you are present. Lord, we are all here today in celebration for this monumentous, just great event, Lord, that we can graduate with, with honor. And that is something that I know many of our families would be pleased to know. And Lord, there's something I really want to pray tonight, something very important. And I just pray that you will give us a hedge of protection and I mean that more than just a hedge of protection on our way back to our homes, wherever you may place us in the world, Lord, but a hedge of protection that will protect us from temptation, to protect us from evil, and to protect us from falling away from you, Lord, because these places that we're gonna be put into are going to test us, challenge us, and make us even consider whether or not we should remain faithful to you, Lord, 
but I pray that in those times of confusion, that we will remember, we will continue to remember that you sent us your son Jesus, and that act alone should prove that not only that you love us, but that you will be with us and you will provide for us, Lord. I pray that you continue to be with us as we leave this college today and joyous celebration for all the wonderful things that are headed our way, as long as we trust in you, Lord. In your son's name I pray, amen.